biggest. Yeah. Oh, look at this. This is where we show up. Yeah, right. Fantastic. 
top of the hill? It doesn't say on there. It's just it's right on. So we're the first one and I'm the third one. Okay. Oh, you're the second one. Great. Do you want to try anything out? Oh, you can try it. I don't know. Do you want to test it out? Yeah, if you want to test it out. Cool. 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 Seattle and 
uh, where I study these communities, free software and free culture communities, as my sort of day job. And also, in a complicated way, free software, not my particular work on free software, free software more generally, has led to the movement that brought us Wikipedia and you know, sort of all the stuff that we've done here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of the free software movement, and in particular, how I believe that free software can help us think about why Wikimedia and its work is so critically important and what it is about what we do that is important. And then I'm going to try to circle back and spend the second half of my talk or so giving kind of what I might call certain ideological progress support, the result of which will be, as you can tell from the title, uh, the idea that I think that we're doing a good job of reforming people, but a less good job of empowering people in ways that are central to our mission. Now, for those of you that are a little newer to our movement, this will hopefully act as a sort of critical context about where we came from and what we're doing and why it's so important. And for the old timers like me, and I see a few other of you here, it'll hopefully act as a, 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 a way of raising what I think are some major achievements and challenges in some ways of thinking about what it is that we're doing. Uh, I mentioned I'm going to start a little bit by talking about free software. Um, I'm wearing a, people may notice a GNU shirt. If you don't know what a GNU shirt is, I'm, not, I'm about to tell you. Um, uh, that's a GNU, uh, or a logo of a GNU. Now, um, when people tell histories of the free culture movement and of free software in particular, you like, have to start with the printer story. It's like a, an almost, like, it's, sort of, it's not apocryphal, but it sounds like it could be. It's been told so many times. The story is that Richard Solman, who was working at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at uh, MIT and who had grown up in a world where you bought computers and those computers came like with software that you were supposed to rewrite and change. Uh, one day bought a printer, his lab bought a printer, and he went to change the printer driver and couldn't uh, because he didn't have the access to the source code for the driver. And he asked the manufacturer of the printer for access to that source code and they said, no, we're not going to share it with you. And then over time, of course, more and more people, I mean, in a way that if you would ask Microsoft for the source code of your system, they would tell you they wouldn't want to share it with you. He, while that seems very normal to us, Stalin was so enraged that he devoted the rest of his life, uh, and it's still going, uh, to uh, fighting against this no and trying to ensure that no one else would ever have to be told no again. He created, he published a document, which I'm, I'll show you some excerpts from, called the GNU Manifesto. Um, he created a uh, project to write a free operating system called GNU, uh, which I'm wearing a t-shirt of. GNU stands for GNU is not Unix, it's a recursive acronym, which is hilarious if you're, uh, I don't know, into programming, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I know it really is funny. And uh, he created an organization called the Free Software Foundation and a movement, a social movement for software freedom. And he created a definition of free software so that people would know what it is he was talking about. Um, uh, this is the definition of free software that he came up with. Uh, and you know, I, I recited in my sleep at this point um, as a participant who's grown up with this. Uh, it comes with four freedoms, which in a way that is also very funny if you're a programmer, are usually numbered from zero to three, um, uh, because that's how programmers count. They start with zero. And uh, freedom zero is the freedom to use software for any purpose. That means that you should be able to use it for, you should be able to use it for uh, commercial use or non-commercial use. Uh, the second freedom is the freedom to study that software and to make changes. That is the ability to sort of make it work in a different way, to change that printer driver or whatever it is. Uh, the freedom, you have the freedom to share the program with other people. Um, so that if someone asks you for a piece of software, you don't have to choose between being a friend, a good friend, and sharing your software and violating the license. Uh, most good friends would have to violate the license and that would be too bad. Um, and the fourth freedom is the freedom to share and collaborate. Um, so anyway, that's the four freedoms as they're normally taught. So I've now done my, this can't be sort of free software educator malpractice in this talk. I can check that off the list. When I talk about, I actually don't like that definition of free software very much because I think it misses, like, like there, there's actually like something very simple at the core of free software, which is actually at the core of all of the movements that it built on it as well, including Wikimedia and the free culture movement. And that's two basic freedoms. The first is um, uh, this idea of access to knowledge. Software is just a certain kind of knowledge, and the reason it's important to share it is because knowledge should be shared. In the GNU Manifesto, Stallman says this, uh, uh, in a way that good manifesto -y. says, I consider the golden rule requires that if I like a program, I must share it with other people who like it. Software sellers who want to divide the users and conquer them, making each one agree to not share with each other. I refuse to break solidarity with other users in this way. It's like good manifesto. And when I read this when I was like 13, it like, 
changed my life. Like really changed my life. Um, uh, uh, like that's why I'm here. Uh, like in doing everything else I do. Um, uh, this is, uh, but this is actually in some ways like the golden rule thing is like the weak form of the argument. Uh, Evan Moglen, who's the uh, head of the Software Freedom Law Center, has the stronger form of this argument. He says that uh, he says that in a world in which like goods have zero marginal cost, that it's unethical to deprive people of that good. Now that, that I understand that's a little bit weird. It basically means if you can produce something, if everyone can have everything everywhere at the same cost that anyone, the Community Foundation is to empower and engage people around the world to collect and develop educational content under a free license in the public domain and to disseminate it effectively and globally. And within that, we see those two parts that I've highlighted as the key issues in the free software definition, right? On the one, we have the idea of, um, uh, we have the idea of access to knowledge around dissemination. And first, we have the idea around uh, empowerment and engagement. Um, getting people involved. So those are the two concepts here, um, and those should seem familiar because they are. They're the two concepts at the core of the free software definition and the free software movement. And if we, uh, um, and this is of course because, uh, uh, I mean, the first bit, I think, the first bit here around access to knowledge is pretty clear. The reason that it's important to have, I mean, in some ways it's even more clear why it's important to have, why it's important that it's like the fake information should be distributed more freely than it is software. Um, I have to make this whole argument about why software is powerful, but, uh, but, but we all understand and use this in information about, I don't know, like reference works about the world all the time. Um, and so it's easier to say, to understand why it's important that people should have access to this. The question of empowerment is a little bit more complicated, but I think that it's really the same issue here. And I've already touched on it a little bit. Um, uh, I mean, I think that that, uh, that that I have this theory that free software is popular with technologists because software is power and technologists understand that they're powerful and they like to think that they're powerful. So if I say, if I tell the story about the phone and I say, the person who designs my software controls me, they're like little gods and programmers are like, yes, we're like gods. They really like this uh, idea. I'm a programmer too, I like it uh, also in that sense. Um, uh, but, but, but software isn't just the beginning of how we Think about the the uh, about about how we understand and experience the world. Right, the issue here is about experience and control, control over experience, and and how much of our experience or understanding of the world comes from what we read. Right, how much of what we how much of it comes from what we read in Wikipedia? Um, too much, maybe uh, um, uh, maybe not enough. The question of who controls what we read is an, an enormously important question. Right, it's the reason why censorship happens. Because the things we read can destroy governments and societies, and build new societies and governments. They can change cultures, and they do. And outside of political expression, cultural works are the medium through which we understand the world and each other. Um, the question of, you know, who controls our culture? And the answer, of course, if I were to ask who should control our culture, the answer is we should control our culture, right? The idea that someone else should be able to control our culture is uh, as ridiculous as I hope the idea that someone else should be able to control our software. Although we all seem to live with that every day. Um, uh, free software, the free software answer, the Richard Solomon answer is you. You should be able to control it. And I think the same answer is here. And I think that this is what's built into the, the, the vision statement, the mission statement of the Wikimedia Foundation, right? The answer is, the answer of who should be, the reason it's important that we be empowered is because it's important that we, the readers, the consumers, the reproducers, should control information about the world. Um, lots of other people have the same idea in their mission statements and in, in our broader movement, the free culture movement. The Students for Free Culture, uh, are the blocks in the middle, um, open access movement, open hardware, and creative commons. Uh, the Creative Commons mission statement has this, thinks that it's important to go out and realize the full potential of the internet, universal access to research and education, full participation in culture. Uh, you notice I use the purple to highlight the two things. You see it again that when we look at students for free culture and their mission. They think that it's important to advance software formats and free cultural works and to promote autonomy um, here as well. Um, so this is, uh, 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 you can see that it maps to these ideas of access to knowledge and empowerment, these two issues. Um, and so with that, I want to move into a little bit of an ideological progress report in terms of those two issues, because these are two issues that pertain um, more broadly to the free culture and free software mission, but also to, uh, to our mission as Wikimedians uh, and as the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that as, I've suggest as I suggest in the title, uh, I think that we're doing better at one than the other. So in terms of access to knowledge, I think that we're actually doing pretty good. Uh, in terms of promoting access to knowledge. Um, this is uh, page used to Wikipedia. This does not include mobile numbers. Uh, there's a dip there at the end, which is a little bit worrying. Um, uh, and 
uh, people are talking about what that is. Um, some of it is probably people moving to mobile. Um, some of it is probably uh, people getting answers to their questions from Wikipedia because Google's just showing them the answers so they don't have to click through and see the pages. Um, but uh, the, it's a little, if you don't read scientific notation, there are about half a billion people a month who are doing Wikipedia, and the number has been going up pretty steadily from about half that in 2008. We've doubled uh, instead of two, a quarter of a billion people a month who are reading Wikipedia. Um, we now have about half a billion people a month. And that's really great because the data that they're reading is free, like really free, like Salman, Salman thinks it's free. Um, uh, like I think it's free. Free as in cultural works. And very few organizations in the world can claim to be doing as much to promote freedom in that sense, in terms of the, to promote access to knowledge in that sense, than, uh, than, than the Wikimedia movement. Um, we should feel really good about ourselves because we're doing a really, really good job in promoting access to free knowledge that can be shareable, shareable, very, very shareable. Um, uh, this is just Creative Commons licenses on Flickr. Um, uh, it's going up. That's the important thing to realize. And uh, more and more people are releasing works even outside of places like Wikimedia because of Wikimedia's example. Um, they're releasing more and more free cultural works, and we have more freely available information more widely. Um, we're promoting real and better access to knowledge in our movement um, and in our organizations and in the context of Wikimedia and Wikimedia projects. And we should be really, really proud of what we're doing in this regard. Um, we're really doing a good job of promoting access to knowledge. But um, uh, things look a little less good when we look at it in terms of empowerment. Uh, um, control and the ability to change and reuse is far less universal in the context of the free culture universe. Um, this is the this is the graph that I'm sure a number of you have seen some version of this, but it's basically the number of active editors in all Wikipedia projects. So this is um, something all up. And you can see that it grows really quickly until 2007 and then sort of changes to not growing so quickly. Uh, and in fact, to sort of going down a little bit over time. Um, and some people think that uh, for a long time, we thought this was sort of stable. It seems to be going down um, over time. So there are less people who are involved in uh, making five edits to Wikipedia or making really any edits to Wikipedia over time. We're doing a less good job of encouraging people to edit Wikipedia. Now, there are lots of reasons and suggestions for why this might be the case. Um, uh, some people think it's like fine, maybe, because maybe one answer people will say, oh, maybe it's just all fun. People don't need to do it. Um, but if what we care about is empowerment, then, uh, then, then this is bad because there are less people who are taking advantage there and who are transcending that role as consumer. Right? There's, there's a sense in which that, that even if many of the people who might be contributing wouldn't contribute as well as we might like, the fact that they're not contributing means that we are not empowering them to contribute, right? Um, or at least they're not, not, not being realized. Um, but actually, this, this graph right here is, I think, really, really underestimates the problem. Um, because remember, back here, the, uh, the, the, the graph here, the, the viewership has been going up really steadily during this period. So this is just from 2008. So I'll show you the same graph, but just from 2008. That's viewership. Uh, sorry, that's the number of active editors from over 2008. And that's the percentage of readers who become active, who are, who are also active editors in a given month over time. This is on the, uh, I guess you're on the, this is your right side. Sorry, I'm really bad at writing them the, the, um, uh, what you see is that although we have what is a relatively stable or slightly decreasing group of people who are involved in active editing, the, the metric, which I think is a much better metric of empowerment, right? How many people who are viewing Wikipedia are taking the step and making an editor two edits, or in this case, five edits, right? Um, uh, and the answer is, it started at, again, that scientific notation, and that's a negative there. That means that we're looking at about one in, uh, one in 2,000, one in, one in 3,000 editors. Um, at the top. Uh, so one in three thousand editors are uh, uh, sorry. One in three thousand readers um, are either read, reader to active editor ratio is about one in three thousand. Three thousand to one. Um, and by the end, uh, six years later, we're at half that. This is a real zero at the bottom of this graph. Um, uh, so like we actually like like when we hit zero, there will be no one who's editing uh, on both of these things, right? And half the proportion of people who are reading are taking the next step and becoming uh, actively involved. And we can look at the, this is, of course, only one metric. Um, uh, of med there are lots of ways of getting engaged in, in, in the community. There are lots of ways of contributing, but editing is the, the one that we cite most often and 
I have yet to see uh, I've yet to see anything, any idea of involvement or engagement um, or contribution or anything which might map to empowerment and contribution, which looks better than this, um, which tells a story which is rosier than this. Um, I would love to hear. I, I mean, I, I'm I'm not a pessimist by nature, so I would love to hear uh, uh, an argument. But I think that we are not doing it. We're, not only are we not doing a great job of empowering people, we're doing a worse job, a much worse job over time. Not just a little bit worse. Um, we're, we're empowering less than half the proportion of people that we were even six years ago. Um, and I think that we should be really worried about that in terms of that mission. Um, uh, this is Creative Commons licenses more broadly in the world. Um, this is an old graph. Uh, this is from, I think, 2000. Six, but the distribution is very similar today. It's getting a little bit better. Um, uh, the point, you can't read that, I understand. But the three most, the three biggest uh, chunks of this are the three most restrictive Creative Commons licenses. Most people that use licenses, are, that use Creative Commons licenses, use licenses which allow their work to be distributed freely that promote access, but that don't provide uh, uh, people either the ability to use them for anything um, or the ability to change them at all um, in many cases. Um, uh, now, it's not clear that either of these things are incredibly bad news. We're doing a good job at part of it, right? Um, and these works might be works that would never have been released at all. They might not have been accessible at all. But at the very least, it's an example of how we're falling short of an ideal of advancing empowerment and participation. Um, uh, nearly half of all Creative Commons licensed works today block the creation of any derivative works. The number is actually getting a little bit better over time, um, but only a little bit better. Um, it might take like 50 years for it to um, for, for, for at the current rate for all Creative Commons works to allow uh, full freedoms. Um, and even then it would be as free as Wikipedia would want it, and Wikimedia would want it to be, to be included on Commons. Um, so uh, why is environment so hard and what can we do about it? Um, I think that one thing that a lot of people don't want to hear is that I think that sometimes we have to choose between access to knowledge or empowerment, that these things come into conflict, right? If we really, really care about empowerment, it might be possible. It, it, um, it might be it's possible that we might have to sacrifice access in certain ways, and that might be okay. I sometimes joke that I think that Wikipedia is the least efficient encyclopedia, or the least efficient way to write an encyclopedia ever created. Maybe the least efficient way to write anything. Um, um, never have people spent so. So economists have this idea. They like in an economic sense of efficiency, right? Like inputs to outputs, right? It takes. If I were just to, to hire people to write an encyclopedia, it would be relatively straightforward, and it would result in something that's pretty good. Um, like if I when I work on Wikipedia, I have to spend an enormous amount of time arguing with with idiots um, uh, um, all the time, and it's great. Uh, like it's really it's it's great because those idiots are being empowered by engaging with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and I am also being empowered by uh, engaging with those idiots. Um, uh, and uh, empower everyone. Um, I think it's wonderful. Um, there are much more efficient ways to build an encyclopedia, but uh, like paying people, like people. But those ways don't. Um, and, 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 and if our goal was just to, per, per, to, to create something which could get out to as many people as possible and answer as many questions as possible, I think we should do those things. Um, uh, um, that would be the goal. But our goal is also to empower people in that process. Right? And sometimes that means that we have to do things like argue with idiots. Um, and that's great. And we should feel happy about it. Um, although it's sometimes hard to feel when you're in the middle of it. Uh, 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 there are lots of other reasons. Um, very often there are technological and organizational systems that we create. There are decisions we have to make which will systematically privilege access over empowerment. So the Wikimedia Foundation launched this really great Wikipedia Zero project, which there's another talk about right now. You obviously don't care about it as much because you would be there uh, and not here. Um, but uh, I'll talk about it in 30 seconds here. Wikipedia Zero is the wonderful project to create, uh, to, create uh, to allow people to access Wikipedia from their mobile phones for free, um, especially in the developing world. And it's really great because through this project, lots of people ha have had access to Wikipedia for free. But for the first year and a half of the Wikipedia Zero project, there was no way to edit or contribute to Wikipedia at all from your mobile device. The mobile editor didn't exist, right? They launched a project which promoted access and for which every person who gained access through that project could not contribute in one of the ways in, which, in the way that the, the foundation indicated. Um, now, it's because the foundation prioritized this, uh, prioritized access and, and, and uh, over the creation of a mobile editor, put work into that, and because they felt it was important, and because the existence of Wikipedia Zero is a very good thing. I'm not arguing against it, I think it's great. Um, but, the, but, but it involved a trade-off. And that trade-off was empowerment for access, at least in the short term. 
Um, they've now created an editor, which is great, and people are using it. And um, I think that's a very positive thing. Um, there are uh, gaps of access and skills. There's going to be a whole talk about skills and how that uh, creates barriers to environment later off in the session, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But I'll give you a quick example from my work in Free Software in the Debian project. Um, the Debian project, uh, you can't submit a, dev, a, a bug to the Debian project. It's an operating system. You can't submit a bug. They have a website where you can see all the bugs, but you can't submit a bug in the website. You have to like run a special program on your in like your terminal to submit a bug or craft a special email of a special format, and it's very difficult to do. And that's the, that's the idea. Um, uh, um, in Ubuntu, which is another similar project, um, they have many many bugs, too many to even look at by by people that I won't say they're idiots, but uh, by people that have trouble finding good bugs. In Debian, the quality of the bugs are much better. The volunteers have an easier time doing it, but they do it by systematically creating like a skill barrier to contribution. They keep people out from contributing um, in order to increase the quality of the product, in order to increase the usefulness to more people. Um, people are, in, are, are intentionally trading these things off, right? Um, and uh, sometimes it might be worth it, but it's something that we need to think about and talk about in those terms. Um, uh, we become gatekeepers um, ourselves in lots of places. Uh, I, once, I once had this amazing experience of being in a class where the assignment had been, I was invited as the guest Wikipedia, and the assignment in the class had been to edit Wikipedia, and someone was talking about their experience and how their edits had been reverted, and I realized that I had been the person that had reverted that, 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 that person in the class. It really, I think they thought the teacher had organized it, like it was a staged thing, but it really, it really wasn't. I was like, wow, I totally reverted you. I'm like, uh, I left a note and you didn't see it. Oh my gosh, I feel really bad. Anyway, um, uh, we provide, uh, we act as these barriers to contribution as well. Um, even people that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not placing myself as like an enlightened person in this space, but uh, um, because I'm definitely not. But, uh, uh, but we become gatekeepers in ways that systematically promote access over empowerment. And um, I think that it's a very, very difficult problem. Um, but it falls on the people in this room to address that very, very difficult problem. Uh, today, there are literally hundreds of thousands of wikis. Wikipedia is the central inspiration. I do a lot of research with uh, Aaron Shaw, who will be talking later, of, on Wikia wikis, and more than 4% of all Wikia wikis have Pedia in the title, because they're, they're copying us, right? Um, uh, what's at stake in our movement and in our projects is much more than Wikipedia and other Wikipedia projects. What's at stake is a broader movement of um, and addressing this issue of autonomy and empowerment is something which, which, which is a transversal issue. Um, because when people realize they can redefine knowledge and the most important single source of knowledge in the world, and they are willing to do it, they are taking control of their experience of the world. Um, and the power of doing that is profound. Um, uh, your work and my work to a small part here is very important. Your work is important, and thank you for letting me be a small part of it. No, that was all. That was all. Uh, all, Wikipedia, all, all Wikipedia's, I think. All language Wikipedia's combined. But it looks the same if you do it in English, because English is a big part of it. Um, it actually doesn't look the same for every single language, um, but it looks the same for many of the largest ones. They're very similar. Yeah. At the back. Yeah. Yes. Maybe. Uh, that's a question. The question was a suggestion that maybe the maybe leaders just don't want to contribute. Well, who's the next person? You should come up and set up. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you had a question up here. Yeah. Um, you so you mentioned we talked a bit about the choice between having to know what's empowering. But possibly, like, one is the other, and it's really staggering. That's a nice idea. Um, uh, I think that we're doing worse, though, right? Like, um, I, uh, I would expect to see. I would expect that uh, yeah, maybe maybe we're just waiting for something to change, um, uh, but I think that we need to do something to change it. No, definitely. <laughs> but I just I mean to me it makes sense that the um, Wikipedia zero. Yeah, Wikipedia zero. Um, it makes sense that uh, to me that access to knowledge is actually first. Yep. And maybe we need to. There are definitely things we could do that might. Uh, 
might help that. Um, the problem is, is that we're doing much better at it's coming, and then it's not coming. It does, it does have to come first. Yeah. But the problem is, is that sometimes it's, it's coming first, and then nothing's coming second. Yeah, that ratio. Yeah, it's a decline ratio. That's a good question. How do I add the measure uh, this was the, that the measure that I presented on that graph was five hundred and twenty. Yeah, that's the that's the definition that most people use in foundation statistics. Which is why I use it. Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming here. Uh, my name is Lionel Alonge. Uh, and my name on Wikipedia is the same. Um, I'm French, and I'm from near Paris, and I um, would like to talk to you about why I think we sometimes need to pay people to uh, create free knowledge. Uh, my um, background is that I come from uh, Wikimedia France, with, uh, which is a French chapter uh, Media, and um, I started uh, editing on Wikipedia, the French Wikipedia, on 2002, uh, November 2002. So on the French Wikipedia, they call me a dinosaur. <laughs> and, and I came to uh, Wikipedia because before that, in 2000, I joined a French non-profit organization in April that is promoting uh, free software. So that's funny that uh, we just heard about free software. Uh, that's interesting. It was I was not aware of that. And um, the idea is that um, uh, since I was a, a computer programmer, uh, I was very interested by free software. And from the start, it was obvious for me that um, in some cases, it was fine to pay people to create free software. And many projects uh, in free software are working uh, with uh, the help of uh, people who are paid to do that. And uh, many, on many projects, uh, people work together whether they are paid or volunteers. And it usually works quite well. So when I started to uh, be interested by Wikipedia, uh, I thought it was going to be the same way. And uh, I discovered it was not. And that there were um, problems with the, the idea of uh, paying people. And, uh, well, you all heard, I guess, about what happened recently with the uh, WikiPR scandal. And uh, so many people started to say that it was uh, a bad idea to have people doing paid editing, which means being paid to edit Wikipedia. And uh, I think it would be a mistake to uh, uh, stop uh, or to, to prohibit having people uh, being paid. And so I'm going to try to show you a few examples where I think it would be uh, very important to be able to pay people to create free knowledge. Uh, I selected uh, especially a project that are not uh, directly paid editing, because since uh, it's a controversial issue, uh, I think um, I, I'm going to start talking to you about uh, things that are not directly editing Wikipedia, but creating free knowledge that could be useful for Wikipedia. The first uh, I thought of was journalism. Uh, I don't know in, any, in most countries, but uh, in France, and I'm, I'm sure in uh, a lot of countries, you cannot be a journalist if you're a volunteer. It's just impossible to get a press card. Especially in France, where it's uh, controlled by the French state, to be able to get a press card, you first need to show that you, your main salary is coming from a journal, a TV, something like that. So you need to be a professional even before you get the press card. And uh, this is a picture of a, a French TV journalist. Um, for those people to be able to work, 
uh, they need a press card because the press card is going to help them, uh, authorize them to go to press conferences, uh, to meet with uh, politicians, with, uh, I don't know, athletes, uh, actors, and uh, many people you just cannot reach if you just a volunteer most of the time. And uh, they also have access to uh, places like factories, uh, power plants, uh, military bases, uh, plenty of places where we as volunteers uh, probably will never be allowed to go. Uh, that press card uh, would be a, a great thing, I, th I think, for us because uh, uh, in many cases we could uh, send a journalist, photographers, uh, videographers uh, to take pictures, to do that kind of things, uh, and we could have the results uh, published under free license. And that will not only improve uh, we can use, but that would improve uh, also all the Wikipedia movement. Another place where we don't really want to send volunteers is places of conflict, of war. And um, I wouldn't dare go there. Uh, I read in the news, I, I think it was last year, that uh, they were doing a, a piece about um, a Japanese man who is uh, taking his vacations only in places uh, with a conflict. He's only going to places where there's a war. Uh, so two years ago he was in Syria. And uh, it's great fun is to go there and take pictures. Okay. But that's really the only one I know is doing that. Most people will try to avoid that. Uh, if we were able to raise money to send a professional journalists to such places, we could get, uh, uh, as I said, free pictures. Uh, when I say free, sorry, I, I should have said that earlier. I don't mean free as a free beer. I mean free as published in their free license. We could get uh, free videos. Uh, we could get uh, press reports published in their free license. Uh, another area where we could pay people is uh, science and especially creating uh, scientific contents like scientific imagery. Uh, this is made with uh, an electron microscope. It's a very huge piece of hardware that is very difficult to use. We need special training, it's very expensive. So in practice, only a few people can access that. And since it costs a little bit of money, well, really a lot of money, uh, the people who have this kind of machinery uh, ask you to pay for it, to pay to use it. So even if we are, in, we are not paying uh, the scientists to do that kind of imagery, we should pay people who are doing the images so that we can get them free. Uh, it would be the same thing for telescope, for example, X-ray machines, all that kind of uh, equipment. Uh, for example, this is a, a something that is already on Wikimedia Commons. Uh, it's a part of a plant, but I just selected it because it looks like an old movie monster. Uh, but the idea is that uh, when you look at, into Commons, we only have a few hundreds of those pictures. And to illustrate Wikipedia, we probably may, may need like yeah, thousands. Another area where uh, I think it would be uh, quite interesting to have uh, people that we could uh, finance. It's exploration. Uh, uh, what I mean exploration is all places where it's relatively difficult to go. Uh, for example, I wouldn't dare to do that. I'm just too fat and I don't like small places, so I wouldn't do that. But I know people are doing, some people are doing it for fun. I don't know why. But but, but uh, they don't always have the time to do uh, free work. I mean, either they go there on their vacation, and so they want to enjoy it, so they are maybe they won't waste maybe time to take pictures or make movies, or they are professionals, and they are probably not going to publish what they do under a free license. Um, some people do, but not a lot. 
So we could send people, uh, teams of people, to go to places like well, caves, uh, jungles, um, like uh, volcanoes, any place you can think of that is uh, probably uh, dangerous and where uh, we should only send, send uh, professionals. Another uh, place where I think it would be interesting to uh, be able to pay people is um, to make plans. Uh, this plan is from a castle in France, a very old castle, and I did it, and I'm not satisfied with it. I think it was really just not very good. And uh, to be able to do it, I, I made, essentially, I made a copy of a plan that was in display in this castle. So really this map has been done by probably a professional architect and I just made a copy of it. And uh, I think that uh, uh, to do that on a large scale, to have numerous buildings and places and even cities where we could have maps, blueprints of the buildings, uh, I'm thinking also uh, plans of uh, ancient cities that are long gone. Uh, I'm thinking also about 3D models of buildings of uh, ancient cities. All this could be made by professionals that are skilled to do that. And uh, we could uh, raise money to pay them to do that. Of course, all that could be done by volunteers, like most of what uh, I'm showing you. But as I said, uh, I think it's, it's very difficult. Uh, if you're not a, a professional architect, it's, it's going to be difficult to do that. Well, it was for me. And uh, if you are a professional, you're going to do that, uh, I mean, perfectly, like uh, it's supposed to be done. Another area where we can uh, pay people is uh, scanning and proofreading of goods. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of uh, people on the Wikimedia movement are already doing that as volunteers. We have the, of course, Wikisource, where a lot of that is done. But there is such a big amount of books that, that are now in the public domain and that we could uh, scan and uh, change into text uh, that uh, probably uh, volunteer work is not going to be enough. Uh, I've seen that uh, places like the Internet Archive is paying people to uh, scan books. Uh, well, we all know that Google is doing that on a very large scale. But they're not releasing, uh, the Internet Archive is releasing what they do in the public domain, but uh, Google is not. So uh, it would be interesting to maybe join with those people like the Internet Archive to be able to pay more people to scan and to proofread those books. Um, when I started being interested in the, everything about free culture, I tried to do that a little bit. Uh, so I went to the first project that did that, that is a project uh, Gutenberg. And uh, I tried to do it a little bit, but it's a tedious work. It's, uh, you have to be very, uh, you have to go very slowly if you don't want to make mistakes. And uh, it's very time consuming. And it's really um, some area where I think we could have uh, people paid to do that. Uh, one of my uh, main uh, area of fun, actually, is drones. It's, uh, you may well, have heard about drones because sometimes they kill people. <laughs> but uh, the one we use, they are uh, used just to take pictures and film and videos. Uh, they are very, something quite new because uh, they are really now something you can buy on the shelf. Uh, and um, they are doing spectacular things like this is a part of the garden in the Palace of Versailles, near Paris, in France. And uh, if you are on the ground, you just don't notice all that. You see just bushes and trees. 
and you can only, you can only get this, uh, this feeling of those French gardens, French traditional gardens, from above. So uh, we were lucky to be able to do those pictures. I, I was there when it was made because uh, the people uh, that are uh, taking care of the Palace of Versailles were very eager to get free pictures of their own gardens. Because what happens is that most of the time, uh, when they receive professionals, uh, for, a, for example, journalists, those people are going to do that kind of pictures, but they are going to keep them for them. So the people of the Palace of Versailles cannot use them or they have to pay fees. So they were very eager to get those pictures. And uh, so they uh, opened the gardens for us. They had a guard with us, making sure that uh, the public was not around the, the engine, the, the drone. Uh, we really, we, they were very open to get those pictures. And now they are using those pictures in their own leaflets, their own documents because they can get them for free. And uh, it was very interesting to do that because uh, um, we were surprised that the first people interested were actually the people of the, the Palace of Versailles. Now with drones, uh, to do that correctly, um, especially in France, but I think now it's uh, uh, more and more the case all around, uh, there's a legislation that you have to obey to, and uh, you have a lot of restrictions. You have to have a special permit to fly those drones in public. Uh, you have to receive authorizations because they don't want you to fly too high or to fly above certain areas. So uh, what we decided to do is that uh, in France, we, we paid a company to help us do that, which means that uh, we actually pay people to get those pictures. Uh, we were giving the orders, but the people were managing to get the pictures we are paid for. Uh, I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, a guy named uh, Albert Chan. He was a French banker uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, and uh, he made a lot of money back then, and uh, he was also a philanthropist. Uh, which means that he was willing to spend part of his money to do something useful to everybody. And since he was a fan of uh, traveling, he decided to uh, take pictures and to make movies about most of the place uh, in the world. So what he did is that he paid it with his own money photographers and movie makers, and he sent them all around the world to get those amazing color pictures, uh, over 70,000 of them. And uh, at that time, taking a picture, uh, it was a little bit difficult than now, because now it's relatively easy. But at that time, you had to bring very large equipment. You have to uh, put it on the tripod. You have to pose for a long time. So it was quite a difficult thing to do, especially when we, they were going all around the world. They went to Japan. They were to, this is in Iran. So uh, he managed to really create a, a very large archive that is named the Archive of the Planet. And uh, uh, all that uh, was going on very well until he went broke because of the Great Depression in the 30s. So everything stopped at that point. Uh, the good news is that we, could, uh, we don't need to be millionaires anymore to do the same thing. Because uh, altogether, the Wikimedia movement is uh, very large. It's uh, quite rich. And so we could do something like that. We could decide to put some of our money uh, 